Hello and welcome everybody. In this video we will discuss section 3.3.2 of the book, which is about the antithetic variable method for Monte Carlo estimation. Let's jump straight in. So to start, let's just recall again how the standard Monte Carlo estimate is computed, where we have that an MC, MC for Monte Carlo equals 1 over n, some j from 1 to n, f of xj, and that's an estimate for the expectation of f of x. The aim in this section and in the previous sections is to estimate the expectation of f of x, where f is a given function and x is a given random variable. And in the estimator, the random variables xj are iid copies of x. So in the previous section we have already seen what happens if we give up the property that the samples are copies of x and if we use instead samples from a different distribution. Whereas in this section we are giving up another part of this definition, namely we are giving up the independent, so the xj will still be samples from the same distribution of x, but we will allow for c samples to be dependent and we will see how that can be used to sometimes reduce the error of a Monte Carlo estimate. So, once we have developed this, the antithetic variables estimate will have the same form as the standard Monte Carlo estimate, so it will still be 1 over n sum j from 1 to n f of xj, but the xj are now dependent on each other, they are no longer independent copies of x. And to understand how to make use of this modification, we first need to remember how did we use the independence of the samples when we analyzed the standard Monte Carlo estimate. In this case, we did two things. We showed that NMC is unbiased, and there the argument was rather simple. We took the expectation, we plugged in the definition, and then in a few steps we took out 1 over n and the sum, and then we used the fact all of these expectations are the same, and we got expectation f of x. And if you look at that argument, nowhere did we use independence. We did use that the xj have the same distribution as x does in the last step, where we went from expectation of f of xj to expectation of f of x. But all the other rules take out constants, take out sums out of the expectation. All of these rules work for dependent variables just as well. So if we allow the xj to be dependent, we will still get an unbiased estimate. Now let's check the variance, which we used for the error. There the argument started out the same, so we just plugged in the definition. And the first step was still similar, 1 over n comes out only this time as 1 over n squared. But the next step is the one where we did use independence, namely we then argued that is 1 over n squared sum j from 1 to n, variance of f of xj. And for that equal sign we did use that the xj are independent. The way we did this is, let me just write this for two terms, so if we have just two, then we would need the variance of f of x1 plus f of x2. And the general formula we had was that is variance of f of x1 plus variance of f of x2 plus two times the covariance f of x1 with f of x2. And at the time we argued since x1 and x2 are independent, the covariance equals zero and we just are left over with the sum of the variances. Then we apply that for n terms and we are all good and got our result. Now, here we need to keep the covariance term since we now assume that the xj can be dependent and we just need to see what can we do with this. So let me just go back. Here the first argument the expectation of the estimator equals the true expectation we want to compute that we use to argue the estimator is unbiased. And then as a consequence, the mean squared error was equal to just the variance of the estimator. The general formula is variance plus bias squared, but the bias is zero. So this variance I write here is really the error of the method. And now if we have this new term popping up in the variance, this extra term is new for the antithetic variable method that can help us or make the estimate worse depending on sign, so the error will be smaller if the covariance term is negative. And that is the main idea. We need to fully understand this to a few more steps. For example, we need to consider more than two terms 
because we will use a large number of n, not n equals 2. But that really is the fundamental idea. If the random variables are dependent, there are covariance terms popping up, one of which we see here. And if we manage to choose them to be negative, then the error overall will be smaller than it was for standard Monte Carlo. So the first thing we need to sort out is what happens for more than two variables. So we have variance sum j from 1 to n f of xj, and we need to work out what is this if they are covariance terms. Now there are a few rules we can use, and the trick is to write the variance as a covariance. You will see for a second why that is a good idea. So one rule is variance of x equals the covariance of x with itself. And that seems to not gain as much, but the big advantage of covariance over variance is it is linear in both arguments. So we have covariance of a x and y, say, is a times covariance x and y. That means we can take out constants. And we have covariance of x plus y with z equals covariance x z plus covariance y z. So it's a bit like multiplying out brackets. If you have x plus y in brackets times z, you would get x z plus y z. And here it works similar only with covariance. Covariance of x plus y z equals covariance x z plus covariance y z. And finally, it's symmetric, which we can use to apply these rules also to the second argument. So covariance x and y equals covariance y and x. And this rule here, that we can take out a plus, that will help us a lot with our sum. So let's apply these rules. First rule, variance equals covariance of the random variable with itself. And now I need to write the same term again, but what I will do, I will, for reasons which will become clear in a second, write k instead of j for the summation index. That does not change anything, but when we take out the sums, then we don't mix them up accidentally. So that is the same term, only written in different ways, so that the next steps get easier. Now we can use the rule with the blue arrow. We can take out plus from the front. So we can write sum j from 1 to n, covariance of f of xj, and then sum k from 1 to n, f of xk. And you see here it's now essential that I named the variables in the first term different from the ones in the second term, because else we would not be able to distinguish which of the f of xj is in the first argument. So that's what we get. So one of them, f of xj, is in the first argument. The sum of all of them is still in the second argument. And now, if we are pedantic, we would now swap the arguments, then take out the second sum and then swap back. I do that all in one step. So it's sum j from 1 to n, sum k from 1 to n, covariance f of xj, f of xk. And now we have taken out all the sums. That looks already a bit simpler. And these covariance terms, these are the ones where we have to hope that some of them are negative. So let's first check we can use the first rule again. So this one, namely, if we have a covariance of something with itself, then it is a variance. And I want to use this for the, ele for the diagonal elements where j equals k. So what I imagine in my mind is a square where j goes from 1 to n and k goes from 1 up to n. And each of the entries in this grid corresponds to one term in the sum. So we have n squared terms because both sums go from 1 to n independently. And the diagonal elements, these are the ones where j equals k. And in this case, we know the covariance of f of xj with itself equals the variance. So what we can do is we can first just write the diagonal elements, write sum j from 1 to n, variance of f of xj. We could do that triangle next. So in this triangle, we do sum k from 1 to n, that's the rows. And then I do sum, in the first row we start at 2, in the second row we start at 3. So j goes from k plus 1 up to n, and actually in the top row we don't have anything. So I write n minus 1 for the first sum, and then we do covariance f of xj, f of xk. And now we also need to do the top left triangle. But the covariance is symmetric, that was the last property I wrote. So covariance f of xj, f of xk equals covariance f of xk, f of xj. So it turns out every element in the upper half has the same value as the mirror image element in the lower half. So what we can do is we can just write a 2 in front, and then we have covered the upper triangle at the same time. So what we have again is we have the diagonal, which gives us a sum which looks very much like it did before, sum of variances. And then we have these two triangular areas which we still need to deal with, but this is the formula we get. 
So what do we have? So first we notice the first term coming from the diagonal that is the same we had when we discussed the error of the standard Monte Carlo estimate and that we can actually equal n times variance f of x and then we still have to divide it by n squared so that gives the term we know from before. Then the second term is a new term since this is just added to the error we want that negative if we can make it so. And the question is, can we make this negative? So there are lots of covariances, there are all of them. So any pair of xj and xk, we have covariance f of xj and f of xk there. So the question is, can we make them all at once negative? And the answer is that it's a bit difficult because if we think, what does it mean the covariance is negative? So if the covariance between f of x1 and f of x2 is negative, that means on average when x1 goes up, x2 goes down. The same holds here, we have all pairs, so we have x1 and x3. Same logic, if x1 goes up, then x3 should go down. And now you see where the clash comes in. If x1 goes up, then x3 and x2 both go down, but they are also meant to be negatively correlated. So we would really like it that if x2 goes down, x3 goes up, but that doesn't work so well. It is difficult to have all pairwise covariances negative at the same time for more than two variables. And it is technically not impossible. You can make it so that you have more than two variables and all pairwise covariances are slightly negative, but that gets more difficult if it gets more and it turns out it is not enough to be worth the effort. So what we will do here is we will just give in and say we only want to have pairs with negative covariance. We can certainly try to arrange it so that the first two are correlated so that covariance of f of x1 and f of x2 is negative. And then it's difficult to add a third variable, but we can have these to be one pair where again we can have the covariance between x3 and x4 negative. And what we do is cut the samples into pairs and each pair try to construct it so that the covariance of f of xj and f of xj plus 1 is negative. So that's what we want to do. And these pairs are called antithetic pairs. We write them in groups, I change notation a bit. So let's say we do x1 and x1 prime, that's the other one in the pair, up to x n over 2 and x n over 2 prime, that is n in total. And each pair or each row has covariance f of say xk and f of xk prime negative. But the rows that correspond to the different pairs, the rows are independent. That's how we generate our samples. We generate pairs. The pairs are generated together. They are dependent and they have negative covariance. But between the pairs there is no correlation, so each pair is independent of all other pairs. I write that on the left. All xk and all xk prime have the same distribution as x does. So we have still copies of x, only they are no longer independent. And now the question is, what happens with the special structure? So most of the pairs, are, most of the random variables are still independent. For example, x1 is independent of x2 and is independent of x3 and x1 is independent of x2 prime. The only dependencies are between x1 and x1 prime and between x2 and x2 prime. So within the pairs we have dependencies. So we have this long sum here and in this sum most covariances are zero but the ones of consecutive values are non-zero. We don't need to count or do anything difficult. We just need to check which ones do we have. So we have covariance of f of x1 and f of x1 prime and so on. And that goes all the way up to covariance of f x n over 2 with f x n over 2 prime. And that's the only ones which contribute and they are certainly present in the sum because the sum goes over all pairs. So what we can write here is just we can write sum k okay, from 1 to n covariance f of xk and f of xk prime. If we arrange things though that every pair has the same covariance, it makes sense because they have all the same distribution anyway, then we would get n times covariance f of x with f of x prime. Let me write that for a generic pair. And that is really the result. So we just need to put that all together. So then mean squared error of z n antithetic variables is first we need to do what I already discussed. This sum j from 1 to n variance f of x j is the first term. There we treat it the same as we did with standard Monte Carlo. So it's n times the variance divided by n squared. So we end up with 1 over n variance f of x. And here we can do the same thing. So what we get is 1 over n times the covariance within 
each pair. And if you have a look at the book, in the book you can find the result about antithetic variables in Proposition 3.27 that does exactly what we just did, except it expresses things in terms of correlations and not in terms of covariances. So let's just understand how that is done. So the correlation of x and y, that is the general formula, is covariance between x and y divided by the square root of variance x times variance y. And we can solve this for covariance. So what we get here is 1 over n variance f of x, I'm just copying, plus 1 over n. And now we solve the definition of correlation for covariance. So we get covariance equals the correlation times some extra terms f of x, f of x prime. And the extra terms are variance f of x and variance f of x prime and the square root of that. So we get this. Then x and x prime both have the same distribution. So these two variances are the same. So what we can do instead is we can just write variance f of x and be done with it. So that is now the formula for the case where we express it in correlations. The correlation in the book I denoted by rho. So we get mean squared error is the old mean squared error 1 over n variance plus, and here we have again 1 over n variance but multiplied with rho. So we get mean squared error zn antithetic variables is 1 over n variance f of x times, and the first term had a 1 and the other one had a rho. And so we see it is as we expected. If the correlation is negative, we gain something, then 1 plus rho is less than 1, the new mean squared error is smaller. If the correlation is positive, then the error actually goes larger. So that is the method, and I think it's quite a clever method, and sometimes if one manages to get rho close to the minimum of minus 1, then one can get quite small errors for Monte Carlo estimates. This is written more formally in Proposition 3.27. What you should do now is you should go and read section 3.3.2 until the end of this proposition. This finishes the basic description of the method. In the next video we will see how to actually use the method in practice.